Welcome back to This Week in Space. The wise guy has hit some celestial pay dirt. NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, launched in December, took this shot of a near-Earth asteroid on January 12th. Designated 2010 AB78, comets have much better names, don't they? This asteroid is 158 million kilometers, 98 million miles from Earth. Diameter is one kilometer or six-tenths of a mile. Scientists say this space rock is not on a path to collide with Earth in the foreseeable future. But an expert panel has just concluded we are not being so wise about conducting a survey of big near-Earth asteroids that could clonk us and wreak havoc. The National Research Council says the goal to find 90% of the Earth-threatening asteroids 460 feet or 140 meters or larger by 2020 will not be met for lack of funding. Scientists say an asteroid as small as 100 feet or 30 meters across could take out a city. If you don't think this is money well spent, go ask a dinosaur what he or she thinks. You know how your mother always told you never to look directly at the sun? Well, the European Space Agency craft known as Proba 2 is ignoring that advice and yielding some cool science. Check out this image rolled out by researchers this past week, their first release since the launch of the probe in November. Proba 2 was designed to test some new technology, but also do some science focused on the sun, like its predecessor SOHO, still out there gazing at the sun. On Mars, the little rover that could and did may still yet, according to her human parents here on Earth, but she's facing a long, cold, lonely winter. This past week, the spirit team threw in the towel on trying to get the rover out of that sand trap she's been mired in for 10 months. With winter looming in March, the focus is on trying to back spirit up a hill ever so slightly so she can better catch the sun's rays when they get low and less plentiful. Basically, spirit is designed to go into hibernation like a polar bear. She'll shut down and then every day turn on briefly to see if she has enough juice to call home. If the power is low, no call. So the team will soon have to kiss her goodnight and hope in spring, August or September here on Earth, she awakens and drops a dime. If all that happens, they have a lot of science planned for a stationary spirit. Just after the announcement, I checked in via Skype with Spirit's project scientist, Steve Squires, in his office at Cornell University. Thank you, Steve Squires, for being with us on This Week in Space. It's um, got to be a bittersweet moment. First of all, just tell us a little bit about the emotions of getting to this point. Oh, you know, it's, it's poignant. It's a mix of emotions. We designed these things to drive, and now we got to get used to operating spirit in a different way. But at the same time, man, it's been six years, you know, a really long time, and it opens up some new opportunities for us. Let's not forget it was supposed to be a three-month mission, right? Yeah. So it's hard to feel too bad about, uh, about stopping uh, in one place for a long stretch after six years. All right. So let's, let's talk about now that spirit is stuck, what can spirit do? Well, when you've got a vehicle can move, that can move, you want to keep moving it. But if you're stuck in one place, there's new science you can do. The thing that I'm most excited about is that by tracking Spirit's radio signal very precisely, as long as it stays still, we can very precisely determine the wobble of the Martian spin axis. And it turns out that how much and exactly how that spin axis wobbles depends on whether the core of Mars is made of liquid iron, or solid iron. So we can actually, we think, in about six months of radio tracking, determine whether the core of Mars is molten or solid. Uh, we can do imaging of the terrain around us, as long as we're not moving, uh, to determine whether uh, the Martian wind is moving sand and dust around on the surface in ways that we never could before. And also, the place where spirit got stuck is bizarre. The, the soil there is made of sulfate salts. It's a place that has a lot to tell us about water on Mars. And by staying there for a long period of time, we can really study these salts in detail and characterize their distribution in a way we never could before. So there's a whole class of new science objectives that have been opened up by this. So is this making lemonade out of lemons, or is it actually something that is scientifically exciting? I think it's scientifically very exciting. I see this as sort of a new phase in Spirit's mission. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways a mission like this could end. One way it could end is some component on board fails and boom, it's over instantly. You never see it coming and you never get a chance to do this. But if the way the mission winds down is the wheels start to fail and you can't move anymore, uh, that enables us to transition in a controlled, thoughtful fashion to a different way of doing science and a whole new class of science objectives. So I, I actually see it as a, as a, a big opportunity and, and there's a lot of worse ways that, is, that this could have gone.
So what, what is the likelihood uh, that Spirit's going to make it through the winter? Do you feel pretty confident? I mean, we just uh, heard about attempts to reach Phoenix, and I know that that was something that nobody expected. Yeah, Spirit's story is a very different one from, from uh, Phoenix. Phoenix, no one ever expected to survive the winter. The sun sets for months at a time, and it's a solar-powered vehicle. It gets encased in ice. Uh, so Phoenix had a rough winter. Um, Spirit was designed for this. Spirit has capabilities built into it to enable it to, to experience and survive very long periods of very low power. Will it survive? You know, I, I don't know, Miles. I mean, I wish I had a good answer in terms of the odds, but you could lose a lot of money betting against Spirit. That is true. Steve Squire is joining us from Mythica. Thanks for your time. Glad to be here, Miles, always. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, Spirit's sibling, Opportunity, is still trucking. She is nearing a crater called Concepcion, which is only about a thousand years old, a veritable infant as craters go. The team is excited because it will be the youngest crater ever explored on Mars. Six years after landing, Opportunity has about 12 miles or 19 kilometers on the odometer for an average speed of .0002 miles an hour. But hey, the gas mileage is impossible to beat. So what do NASA aerospace engineers do in their spare time? They dream up some wild ideas. Lovers of jetpacks and the Jetsons will love this one. It's called the Puffin. It's an electric powered tilt rotor vertical takeoff personal aircraft powered by a 60 horsepower motor. It supposedly will go 149 miles, 240 kilometers an hour and climb to as high as 30,000 feet or 9,000 meters. NASA's Mark Moore unveiled his concept at the American Helicopter Society meeting. The Pentagon might like Puffin for stealthy special ops missions. But will it be the solution to endless traffic jams? Who knows? But it would be one way to rid yourself of those pesky backseat drivers. Thanks for joining us on This Week in Space. As always, we're interested in hearing from you. You can send us an email at twist at spaceflightnow.com, tweet us at This Week in Space, and comment on our blog, milesobrien.com. You can also check us out on iTunes and friend us on Facebook. Coming up on the next program, more than 70 years after the Hindenburg gave the Z word a bad name, the Zeppelin is back in the United States and it's making its home at the former Navy airship base we now call NASA Ames. And don't worry, these days it's filled with helium. We'll see you then.